Well, yes, thank you to PNI for the invitation to talk today. I'm really excited to be here and to share with you um, some work we've done studying the effects of polymeric or lipid nanoparticle self-amplifying RNA formulation on both the protein expression and vaccine immunogenicity. So as Vicki said, I'm Anna Blakeney. I'm an assistant professor at UBC. So just to give you an outline of my presentation, I'll, for those who aren't familiar, I'll go over what is self-amplifying RNA. I'll then talk about the formulation strategies we used in our studies, so polymeric and lipid nanoparticle formulations, as well as looking at the effect of the formulation on both the intramuscular protein expression, as well as the overall systemic vaccine immunogenicity of these two different formulations. So I like to think about why do we even need new types of vaccines? There's obviously lots of different types of vaccines that have already been approved and work well enough. So uh, some of the reasons that we need to develop these new vaccines is the lack of efficacious treatment for many devastating infections, such as HIV-1. We've recently seen the emergence of multi-drug resistant bacteria, so vaccines could be a way to tackle this problem as well. We're always looking to improve both the safety profile of, li of licensed vaccines. Uh, one that's near and dear to all of us now is disease outbreaks, so being able to develop a vaccine quickly in the event of a novel pathogen. We also need to consider the changing age structure of the population. So Elderly people often respond differently uh, to vaccines, and so we need to be able to have different vaccines for different generations, as well as looking to reduce the cost and time to required to produce these vaccines. So the two that we're specifically looking to do with this self-amplifying RNA platform is being able to prepare vaccines for disease outbreaks, as well as reduce the cost and time required to produce vaccines. So I just wanted to start off talking about how is self-amplifying RNA different from messenger RNA. And at the top of the screen, you'll see a, uh, the anatomy of a self-amplifying RNA molecule. You'll notice that it's very similar to messenger RNA. So at the five prime end, it has a cap and a three prime end, it has a poly A tail. So these just help to protect the RNA from degradation. It, all ha it also has an untranslated region at the five prime and three prime end. Um, this helps with the replication of the self-amplifying RNA. It then has four non-structural proteins, which are derived from a viral genome, in this case, uh, VEB, and then a subgenomic promoter and the gene of interest. So in this case, um, we have luciferase, but this is also where you would put your vaccine antigen. So the schematic below shows the difference between messenger RNA and self-amplifying RNA once the RNA enters the cell. So on the right, you'll notice the messenger RNA, you know, one copy of the RNA gets into the cell, it engages with the ribosome, and then the antigen is translated. But whatever RNA you start with, that's how much RNA is delivered to the cell. However, for self-amplifying RNA, uh, when this molecule engages with the ribosome, we get some antigen translated from this original strand, but it also translates this, repl this replicase enzyme. The replicase then engages back with the original strand of saRNA. The whole strand is replicated, and thus we get much higher antigen from the same dose of RNA that's originally delivered to the cell. However, as Andy said, one of the major challenges is getting the RNA across the cell membrane. So some of the advantages of using self-amplifying RNA compared to the other nucleic acids are that you'll notice that there are some major structural differences between these. So for plasma DNA, it's a circular double-stranded construct, usually around 7,000 base pairs. For messenger RNA, it's a single-stranded linear RNA construct, usually around 2,000 nucleotides, depending on your gene. But for self-amplifying RNA, while it's structurally similar to messenger RNA, it's much larger. So it's still a linear RNA single-stranded construct, but usually around 10,000 nucleotides. So it's a very large mo molecule. Compared to plasma DNA, it doesn't require delivery into the nucleus of the cell, so it's slightly easier to deliver. And there's also no risk of integration into the host genome, um, which is advantageous from a safety perspective. Compared to messenger RNA, it has the self-amplification properties that I ex explained on the previous slide um, that leads to exponentially more copies of RNA once it's in the cell and thus higher protein expression. So one of the things um, in the field that I think is kind of underappreciated right now is that this is a schematic taken from a, a review that was published a few years ago, and it details, you know, all the ways that RNA is sensed within the cell. So, you know, we have 
good knowledge about these endosomal RNA sensing pathways. So all of the toll-like receptors, three, seven, and eight for RNA, as well as the cytosolic RNA sensing. So, you know, through MDA5 or RIG I. Um, and what's mentioned here, but is much less known is how the carrier is sensed and what is the role of the carrier in this RNA delivery. Um, so moving on, the paradigm in the field for making any sort of particles for the delivery, as many people are aware, is we have this large negatively char charged SARNA molecule, and we complex it with some sort of positively charged delivery vehicle. Um, these are combined in a microfluidic platform, such as PNI's Ignite system, which was used for these studies, and we end up with a particle where the RNA is encapsulated on the inside of the particle. So there's kind of been three major ways this has been done in the field thus far. So polymeric nanoparticles, lipid nanoparticles, which are the most advanced delivery platform, um, as well as nano emulsions. So in the studies today, I'll talk about a head-to-head -head comparison of a polymeric nanoparticle and lipid nanoparticle delivery systems. So the goal for this study was really to do a head-to-head -head comparison of an optimized polymeric and an optimized lipid nanoparticle formulation of self-amplifying RNA. So on the left, our polymeric delivery system is called PABLE. This is a bioreducible cationic and linear polymer. So we, this was developed during my postdoctoral work at Imperial College London in collaboration with Molly Stevens Lab. And you can see here, the particles are simply made up of the SARNA and uh, the PABEL polymer. On the right, we have the lipid nanoparticles that were, uh, the formulations were provided by PNI. And you can see here, this is um, a little more complicated. So uh, this is the typical formulation for a lipid nanoparticle for SARNA delivery, which includes an ionizable lipid, a phospholipid, cholesterol, and a pegylated lipid. In this study, we actually used two different phospholipids, so DOPE and DSPC, which will be noted throughout the presentation by either PE or PC. The first thing we did was look to characterize these formulations um, for using both dynamic light scattering as well as the encapsulation efficiency. So the different groups that we have here are PABLE, which is our polymer, and then five different lipid nanoparticle formulations. So you'll notice that there are four lipid mixtures um, that were formulated with DOPE, and then one that had the same components as lipid mixture three, but formulated with DSPC. When we looked at the particle diameter of these formulations, they were all very similar. So around 80 nanometers for both the polymeric and lipid nanoparticles uh, with a polydispersity index of about 0.1. Um, when we looked at the zeta potential, so the surface charge of these polymers, you, or of these particles, you can see that for the pable part of particles, we still had a positive surface charge of about uh, plus eight. Where, whereas for the lipid nanoparticles, they were all about neutrally charged. So this is one of the major differences that we saw for these particles. Um, when we then went to ca characterize the encapsulation efficiency, you can see for the lipid nanoparticles, they were all greater than 84%. Um, and for the PABLE, because it doesn't require any downstream purification after the complexation, we get 100% encapsulation efficiency. Um, so we didn't see any differences in the size or the encapsulation efficiencies between these particles, um, but we did see a difference in the surface charge. We next looked to do an in vivo study to look at the intramuscular protein expression. So in this study, we used luciferase as a reporter protein, um, which was injected intramuscularly in mics. We then characterized or quantified the luciferase expression as total flux on the y-axis. Again, we have the same groups of the polymer versus lipid nanoparticle formulations, PABLE in blue, and then the lipid nanoparticles below. And what you can see here is that there's a very stark difference between how much protein expression we're getting in the muscle from our polymer compared to any of the lipid nanoparticles. So um, compared to even the highest performing lipid nanoparticle, it's about two, two orders of magnitude higher, a hundredfold higher intramuscular protein expression with the PABLE polymer. Um, of all of the lipid nanoparticles, you can see that the highest we saw from was from the lipid mix four with DOPE, and the lowest was from lipid mix three with DSPC. Um, so I think it's always helpful to see, you know, picture is worth a thousand words. It's really obvious how much higher the protein expression is with PABLE. Um, so this is just the images of the mice that were 
um, imaged using IVIS. So you can see with PABEL, there's a really strong signal from all of the lakes that we see. And this was much more variable for all of the uh, lipid nanoparticle formulations. So uh, some uh, one observation is just that pay, this PABEL polymer reliably induces much higher intramuscular protein expression than actually any lipid nanoparticle formulation that we've tested to date. But on the contrary, we then wanted to see how these formulations act as a vaccine. So in the first instance, we uh, prepared a flu vaccine using hemagglutinin from the Cal-09 virus. And in this study, mice were injected at zero and four weeks. And then uh, the antibodies, circulating antibodies were characterized at four and six weeks. So on the y-axis, you'll see the HA-specific IgG. Um, and then each of our groups. So you can see for the PABEL, we see a pretty good immune response. After six weeks, we see about 10 to the fifth nanograms per mil of antibody in the blood. Um, but for the lipid nanoparticles, even though we didn't see as high of protein expression, we see a much higher immunogenicity. So for our highest performing LNPs, we see actually just above 10 to the sam 10 to the seventh nanograms per mil. So even though the PABEL was 100 times higher for the protein expression, the lipid nanoparticle formulations were 100 times higher for the immunogenicity. So we also um, then challenged these mice with flu, um, which usually generally correlates really well with the amount of antibody in their blood. So you can see here, we have the naive group. Um, and after five days, all of the mice in that group had met the endpoint. Um, and on the y-axis, we have the percent body weight loss. For the PABEL group, you can see that all of the mice survived, um, but we did see about 10% weight loss at the peak, so they weren't you know, completely protected in this instance. And with the lipid nanoparticle formulations, you can see that with our uh, formulations that had the highest antibody titers, we don't see any weight loss in these mice. Um, but for the lower uh, formulations with the DSPC, um, which had you know, the lowest antibody titers, we do see a little bit of weight loss, but not much. So the conclusions here are really, we see these a good level of HA specific IgG levels, um, which reflect the change in body weight for this challenge mo model. And we've also seen that the formulations that were made with DOPE had consistently higher levels of protection than DSPC. So we then went to look um, and at whether this was you know, antigen specific, does this work for multiple different models? So we use SARS-CoV-2 as another model. And in this case, we did a dose response and looked at different routes of administration with our leading lipid mix. So this was lipid mix three uh, formulated with DOPE. And in this case, we used five different doses of saRNA. So starting at one microgram all the way down to 0 0.0001 microgram or 0 0.1 nanograms. Um, we also used a one microgram table group as a comparison. And then we also dosed mice. So all of these mice were dust dosed intramuscularly, which is our standard. And we also looked at um, dosing a group of mice with one microgram of lipid nanoparticles intranasally. So what you can see here is on the left, we have the systemic SARS-CoV-2 specific IgG at four and six weeks. Um, in the blood. And we also measured the mucosal SARS-CoV-2 specific IgG. So uh, what you can see here is that from our highest one microgram group, we see a really good response. So it works, you know, for multiple antigens, we see about uh, just over 10 to the fifth nanograms per mil for our SARS-CoV-2 specific IgG in the blood. A really nice dose response curve. So you can see even down to our lowest dose of 0.1 nanograms, we still see some response, although much more inconsistent at this very low dose. We see an okay response for PABEL, but again, it's much higher for the lipid nanoparticle formulations. And interestingly, when we dose the mice uh, intranasally, we do actually see a good systemic um, IgG response, although it's much uh, lower than the same dose given intramuscularly. We see a similar drop-off at the mucosal IgG that we detected. So uh, at this, we only looked at one time point at six weeks. And again, we see a really nice dose response, although it really starts to drop off with these lower doses of the lipid nanoparticles. We didn't see any mucosal response for the PABEL group, um, and actually only a, a very small response as well for the group that was dosed with lipid nanoparticles intranasally. 
Um, but this was interesting because we do still see a really good response mucosally for the, the 1 and 0.1 microgram doses of the LNP formulated saRNA. So we then went on to look at the functionality of those antibodies. So we see, you know, quite a high quantity, but how well do those antibodies work at neutralizing the virus? So this is the same study. We just used some of the SARA to do a pseudo neutralization assay. So this is expressed on the y-axis as the IC50. You can see from the two highest doses of lipid nanoparticles, we see an IC50 um, just above 10 to the three. This again is a nice dose response. We didn't see any neutralization from the lowest dose, which you know, correlates very well with the low quantity of antibodies that were detected. And we do actually see some neutralization even from the mice that were dosed um, intranasally with the lipid nanoparticles. And what you'll notice here is that the neutralization is approximately equivalent for the one microgram of lipid nanoparticles dosed intranasally as it is to the 0.01 microgram do dosed intramuscularly. So it's about a hundred fold lower for these lipid nanoparticle formulations when they were dosed intranasally. Although I will say these formulations were in no way optimized for an intranasal administration. We just wanted to try it out. So we then looked at the cellular responses as well using an interferon gamma LE spot. So uh, after the mice were vaccinated, um, six weeks, we took out the splenocytes. And so on the y-axis, um, you'll notice that this is expressed as the spot forming unit per million splenocytes. So they were re-stimulated with the SARS-CoV-2 spike antigen peptides and then quantified for how many of those splenocytes were um, secreting interferon gamma. So you'll notice here for all of the lipid nanoparticles, we see a really good cellular response in addition to the antibody response. So for the highest doses, it's around, you know, between 1,000 to 1,500 spot forming units per million splenocytes, a really nice dose response curve down to our lowest group where we see still a little bit of response, but just to about 150 to 200 spot forming units per million splenocytes. We see an okay response for the one microgram of cable and one microgram of lipid nanoparticles dosed intranasally, um, about 250 spot form units per million splenocytes. So you can see that when you dose these lipid nanoparticles intranasally, you see a much muted cellular response compared to the, the groups that were dosed intramuscularly. So with that, we wanted to start to look into what are these particles actually activating um, and, you know, do the particles themselves have any reactogenicity? So we looked at a Th1, Th2 panel uh, using Luminex. So the mice were injected and then four hours later, we took a sample of blood and measured all different cytokines in the blood. Uh, so what I've presented here is just um, a sampling from that panel. And you'll notice there were some that had no differences. So we actually didn't see a difference in the interferon gamma. There was a slight trend of increase in the IL-12 for the formulations. Um, and for IL-4, we did actually see an increase compared to the naive mice for both the one microgram of lipid nanoparticles dosed intramuscularly, the PABLE dosed intramuscularly, and then the lipid nanoparticles dosed intranasally. Um, but the main difference that we really detected between the PABLE and the lipid nanoparticle formulations was down here in IL-6. So if we look here, you can see that the uh, one microgram of lipid nanoparticles dosed intramuscularly had a significantly higher level of interleukin-6 in the blood four hours after administration, whereas this was not increased for any of the other groups compared to the naive animals. So the main difference we see here between the PABL and the lipid nanoparticles was IL-6. This is by no means an exhaustive investigation into this, but just starting to think about how do these delivery systems actually activate the cells in addition to the RNA. So in conclusion, as far as the particle characteristics go, we see that the polymer and lipid nanoparticles have a similar size and encapsulation efficiency, but the lipid nanoparticles are neutrally charged, whereas PABL still had a positive charge to it. For the protein expression, we see that the polymeric nanoparticles induced 100-fold higher intramuscular protein expression, whereas for the immunogenicity, we see that the lipid nanoparticles induce 100-fold higher immunogenicity against both influenza and SARS-CoV-2. We also see that the intramuscular administration yields higher antibody responses and neutralization than the intranasal inoculation for these formulations. Uh, as far as the cytokine activation, we see that the self-amplifying RNA formulations and the route of administration can cause this acute cytokine-driven reactogenicity as well.
And with that, I'd like to acknowledge all of the collaborators on this project. So uh, Robin Shattuck and his group at Imperial College London, as well as Molly Stevens and our collaborators in that lab, as well as our collaborators at Precision Nanosystems.